Well, thanks so much for having me. My name's Perry Kirby, as I had uh, mentioned earlier. I've, I've known Mike, uh, our kids grew up together, so I've known him for quite a while. I was a little nervous, though, to come here, knowing that he, after one week, he's done, right? That's it. One week, he's out of here. I'm like, oh no, it's, you know, this, is, this is a little nerve-wracking. Um, but so thankful to be here and, uh, and looking forward to spending some time here with you guys this morning. Um, I, I, I know we're, we're, I've met a few of you, so we're fast friends now. I'd love to chat about what we've been through in the last several years. It right? Has, hasn't, hasn't been all that easy. Uh, I think it's easy to dwell on the things that haven't been great and, uh, and it's not hard to even pick out what some of those things are, is it? I mean, we, anybody, you just say the word COVID and we almost cringe now, right? We, we're like, we're over it. We, we don't want to hear that anymore. Um, certainly the war in Ukraine, you look at earthquakes that just happened in, in Turkey and Syria, school shootings that are happening, LGBTQ plus movements, and there's just so much in society that just, it's easy to get discouraged, isn't it? It's, it's challenging. It's easy to focus on those things. And, um, and I think, I think um, with these feelings of hopelessness and these feelings of, of, of um, frustration, if, if you don't just feel bad for ourselves, we certainly feel bad for the next generation that has to come through and live in a world like we're seeing today. And yet I, I don't think this is the first time we've went through things like this. This isn't, like, uh, this isn't unique to us as a society, as a group of people. Certainly there have been times in the past that have been challenging. Uh, we, could, we can look at biblical times. We know the time of Noah uh, certainly could have, must have been a super challenging time for Noah. You think of the Israelites wandering in the desert. That couldn't have been easy. You think of the captivities of Israel, like Babylon coming in and, and, and the countries under control, not under control, just constant turmoil happening. And, and we can, we can uh, look at the crusade times in Europe. There, there, we certainly aren't in a place where, we, where human beings have never been before. Yet, to us, it's real. It's hard. It's, it's challenging. I, I want to I talk this morning about really four steps of, of getting closer to God. And they're just four simple steps. The Bible is full of steps. This isn't like a secret magic formula. You do these four steps and voila. It's just four steps. But I think, I think there's been a number of people, biblical, uh, that we have biblical references of. And we're going we're gonna to look at Paul, Saul, then Paul. We're going to look at his life and see how he took these four steps. I... I I suggest probably many of you have taken these four steps in one way or another. And I, and I pray as believers that as we take these steps, it, it gives us perspective on a world that's challenging, but a God that is great. And that's a perspective that I, I would love to share with you this morning. Um, before I get there, I, I, wanna, I want us to think about the time of Paul. And, and let's go back to when he was Saul. So Saul, uh, listen, to the, listen to the world when he was Saul becoming Paul. So if you look at Acts chapter 8, this is the time when Stephen, just after Stephen was martyred, uh, it said Saul approved of that killing. He approved of it. He encouraged it. He thought it was wonderful. And it says, on that day, great persecution broke out, and all but the apostles were scattered. So now as believers, they're being scattered. It says that Saul began to destroy the church. Now, can, imagine this. This, this sentence in, in, in Acts 8.3 it just perplexes me. I can't imagine it. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and woman, women and took them to prison. I, I can't imagine living in a society like that where people would come to our houses, find out we're believers, and take us away. The challenges of that, of that time to proclaim the name of Christ must have been great. Goes on in Acts chapter 9, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats. 
against the Lord's disciple. And if he found anyone who belonged to the, to the way, whether men or women, he wanted to put them in prison. So I say all that to say, like, our times are tough. Our times are challenging. But let's appreciate they're not as, as challenging as they could be or could become. And yet other believers before us have been in equally challenging times. There's two verses that I want to turn to in Psalm 9. So if, if, you have your, if you have your Bibles, let's jump to Psalm 9. I want to read two verses. And I think these four, it's quick verses, but some very deep steps that I think just really have spoke to me as I put this together. So, so turn to Psalm 9, and let's look at chapter, or verse 1 and 2. And I'll read that to you. It says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all of my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praises of your name, O Most High. I'm going to suggest there's four steps growing closer to God in here. There's four things in these two verses that speak loud and clear to me. The first one is to give thanks. I don't, you know, it doesn't just say to give thanks. It says, to you, Lord, with all of my heart. It seems to, like, put a little more emphasis on this giving thanks concept. It's, it's one thing to give thanks, and I think before meals we give thanks, and and even before this service, we pray and give thanks to God. And, and there are times we give thanks. But when it comes to the all my heart, I don't know about you, but to me, giving thanks with all of my heart is a real challenge. There's probably places in my heart that I'm challenged to give thanks. There are some challenging days in my life that it's hard to say, God, I'm thankful for that. And there are some challenging moments in my family's life and for those around me where I say that's hard to give thanks. I am, a, I am super thankful. My wife is here, uh, an, an amazing woman. We've homeschooled our, four, our three kids for, for their entire um, elementary, middle school, high school career. She's, she has homeschooled them all the way through. Two of them are now in college at Cedarville University down in uh, southern Ohio, and uh, it's a Christian school where uh, our daughter is about to graduate in May in nursing, and our son is a sophomore in business. We have a daughter at home who's uh, going into her senior year, and uh, we're just so thankful for each of them, and, it's, and, it, and there's a lot, a lot to be thankful in that, and yet I'm not sure I do it with all of my heart. I'm not sure I do it completely. And I think there's a different step here. And um, one of the steps that really encourages me is, um, is some of the steps that Paul took in this. And, and when we get to each, I'm going to take you through these four steps, but when we get to each one, I want to encourage you to look at what Paul's heart was. Coming from a murderous background of believers, coming from from someone who I can't imagine the guilt and the shame of what it must have been like to say, I was against you, God, so, so much that I wanted to see your people persecuted. And, and yet his thankful heart, and I want to talk about that in a second, but the second one is to tell, to tell others. As believers... Every conversation we have is telling someone something. Every conversation. Can, can you even imagine the number of conversations that you've had in your lifetime? How many conversations have you had? And yet every single one of those is an opportunity to tell others about Christ. It doesn't have to be the gospel or salvation in that particular one, but every one of them. I believe is an opportunity. Every time we talk, every time we converse, is, is an opportunity to demonstrate Christ in a practical way in that conversation. 
So to tell others. The third one is to be glad and rejoice in God. And that is, the key phrase in that is, well, there's two, two parts that really stick out to me. The be, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then in God, which is the, really the key to that phrase. And then finally, sing praises to God. And, and um, um, if any of you um, are like me, the singing part is, is a challenge. Not, it's not good. Uh, as a matter of fact, my, my youngest daughter has a, a small, small joke that talks about how well I sing. So I'll sing around the house, and, and I will, uh, she'll go, Dad, you really need to go solo. Solo that no one can hear you. <laughs> so that's how well I sing. And, uh, and so the sing praises, but I, I, I'm, I like to read this verse. I do like the sing, and I love to give it the old college try. But I believe that there's even more to it, even like a soul that sings out to God. That maybe there's more than just verbally singing, but actually a life that sings these praises to God. And we'll, we'll get into that as well. And those are the four steps that I, I see in these two verses that I think they've all taken. And, um, you know, one of the observations that I make in Scripture is this, and I'm always challenged by this, is when... I want, you to, I want you to think about this as we're going through these, these scriptures in Paul's life that we're going to go through in a few minutes, how he did these four steps. And I suggest many others did as well. One of the observations I make is, when is, some, when is God calling me to follow him? And when, is, and when is it my chance or my time or my opportunity to go tell others what the Lord's done for me. So in other words, when is it my time to grow? Because there are times when God's calling me to grow. He's not sending me out into a, into a ministry, into a mission. It's my time to grow in areas. And sometimes that's through circumstances. And sometimes that's through scripture. Sometimes it's obviously through a combination of both. But, but there's a time in our lives when it's time to grow. And there's a time in our lives when it's time to help others grow. To be there for them. And I, I, I want to plant that seed in your mind because it's interesting in some of these scripture readings we're going to go into today where Jesus will say, follow me. And there's even a scripture we're going to read today where Jesus says, no, don't follow me. Go tell others. Go tell them what God has done for you. And I find that interesting and we're going to dig into some of that today as well. Um, I, to, to put this into perspective, because maybe that's a little confusing, let me put it into perspective. So, I, I, athletic, I grew up athletically. I, I played baseball and basketball. And I, I, let, let me jump into basketball, because I think it's an easier illustration. So, as a, as, as a little, you know, six, seven-year-old, I would shoot baskets in my driveway. Trust me, I was not ready at that moment to go out and show the world my basketball skills. I was just shooting. I was not good. I was dribbling it off my foot. It was hard. It was, it was clumsy. I didn't make much. I sometimes couldn't even get the shot to the rim if I got too far away. But then I'd start to play with friends. So I'd take, take my skills out and I'd try them a little bit, right? I'd play with some friends and, in, the, in the driveway and if I messed up there, it wasn't all that bad, right? Because it was just with some and then I would come back and refine my skills some more in the driveway and maybe by myself and know things I had to work on. And, and then I might go out and now we're going to play our friends against some other friends. So now it's a more organized game. And eventually play on a, on a high school team and like et cetera, right? So, so my point to that is there's times to spend practicing my trade, practicing basketball, and then there's times when I come out and I, and I take it public. I take it to others. I try to make them better by being a good player. I try to make my teammates better by, by, because I've practiced and done the things that I've done. And I think it's the same in, in, in music. As, I've, as I told you, I'm not really all that musically talented. So I, my story is from watching my daughter, who could play a couple different instruments. And the first time she picked up the piano or the violin, she was not ready to leave the house. This was not the time to do it. 
but after practice and after, t then she could go play maybe a solo for people like a group like this. And then she could go join a group of people who played instruments and do it together. And there's a progression there that happens. There's a time to practice and there's a time to go public. And I think God does the same in our lives. There's a time we sit and take in and grow and develop, and there's a time that we go public. And we have our conversations mean something to someone around us in a way that transforms their lives. You know, Paul, I, I want to give you a modern day example. So, um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son. He didn't just go public. He didn't just grow up in this wonderful Christian home with the arguably the most influential evangelists of the 20th century and just step out and arrive and had it. No, 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 that's not how his life went. He actually rebelled against the faith. As a matter of fact, he was so frustrated. And you can imagine, dad's always on the road. He's got time and attention for everybody else, but not for his son. I can only imagine how hard that was to grow up in, in that home. And he rebelled against the faith. And he, he actually, um, it got so bad they put him into a boarding school. And he blew that opportunity, got kicked out of boarding school. He then traveled to Europe to further run away. And as he was, actually, he, he was spending a life of indulgence in Europe, away from the faith, encouraging everything God wouldn't encourage in his life. And of all places, he came to Jerusalem as a place of curiosity. And he was reading through the famous chapter 3 of the book of John. And he came to the conclusion that he was a Nicodemus that he needed to be born again, that he wasn't saved. He'd heard the message countless times. Probably just like lots of friends and family we know that have heard the message lots of times and just had never came to a saving place. And in Jerusalem, he, he comes to a saving place and decides he needs to be born again. He comes back and and can't immediately get involved in his dad's ministry. I think it, it was a moment of shame, I would imagine, where he just didn't feel like I should just be able to go, voila, I'm saved, now I can just join the family ministry. and be. No, that wasn't how it worked out. Actually, a friend of the family, Bob Pierce, asked him, why don't you come join a ministry I've started called Samaritan's Purse? And he did. He helped him out. He was just a sidekick, if you will, that helped in Samaritan's Purse. Bob Pierce sadly uh, became ill and passed away from leukemia. And Franklin Graham took over that ministry, which today is arguably one of the best run ministries in the world. The people they reach out to through Operation Christmas Child and, and through those who are in need overseas and in this country is amazing. Well, he wasn't done running because he still wouldn't join the family, uh, the, the, the family crusade business, if you will. And, and finally, another friend of the family approached him. John Wesley White asked him if he would speak at a crusade in Alaska. And of course, because dad didn't ask and it was way up in Alaska, he's like, what harm could this be? I guess I'll go speak at a crusade in Alaska. And he did, spoke at the crusade. And after that crusade was done, God spoke to him very clearly to Franklin. He said, I've been running from the very thing you've called me to. And shortly thereafter, sure enough, he um, went into his father's ministry as well to the Billy Graham Crusade Association and Ministry. I love that story because God's faithful to finish what he started. And, and uh, if you're here today, God's not done with you yet. God still longs to draw you close to him. God still has a purpose for you. And there are people around you who desperately need Christ's light in their life. 
And I'm convinced he's calling each one of us to be that light in the people around us. And these four steps are four things that we can do to help us uh, take it. So let's go back to the very first one. And before I go into the before I go to the very first, before I go to giving thanks and, and dive into that a second, I want you to know I'm speaking to believers when I go through these four steps. These four steps do not make sense to a non-believer. They're not just fun things God wants us to do no matter who you are. That, that's some, there are some things in the Bible like just do these. Even if you're not a believer, they're good for you. These steps are only beneficial if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. It's the only way they're beneficial. They only make sense if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. If they don't make sense to you or they just don't seem to resonate, then, then maybe the question is, am I like Franklin Graham in Jerusalem and am I a Nicodemus still? Even though I've heard it, even though I've l- talked about it, lived it, can talk the language, maybe I need to be born again. Maybe I need to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. And once that happens, these four steps are valuable steps to get us closer to God. So this first step of giving thanks, I think, I think Paul, this is what's beautiful about Paul's writing. These four steps are so clear in Paul's life. They're so clear. He wrote so specifically about each one of these steps. So in giving thanks, I want to jump over to Colossians 3, 15 through 17. And I'm going to put, I'm jumping all around, so I'm going to put these up on the, on the board. Uh, Maybe hard to read from where you're at. I'm going to read them out loud. Um, But I'm going to jump all over the place because Paul talked a lot about these four steps. And um, so this first one of giving thanks, he says this. He says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with a gratitude in your heart. And whatever you do, let me say that one more time, and whatever you do, whether in word or whether in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wow, that's a high call. Whatever you do, word, deed, may I add thought, may I add intentions, everything we go through, all of it. We do it in God's name and we give thanks as we do it. So here's Saul. Remember Saul, he's the guy who wants to drag people out of their houses and put them in prison. He's the one approving people being stoned and murdered. He's the one that wants to destroy the church. Is now saying, hold on, I got that wrong. I'm a new man. I've got it figured out now. I had a revelation with Jesus Christ, and I now understand that every single thing that I do Whether I'm talking or whether I'm doing it, it doesn't matter. Everything I do, I do it all for God. I do it all for Jesus Christ. And I give thanks. So that's the all of your heart. Like that's back to Psalm 9-1 where it says, give thanks with all of your heart, with everything you have, every moment, every opportunity. And I think as a believer, when you truly come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, your heart can't be anything but thankful. Like when you truly realize what Christ did for you, that should have been us on that cross. That should have been us that paid the price for the sins. I mean, if there's any way to be redeemed and get into heaven, there's got to be some kind of a penalty or something we have to pay for or something we have to do. But guess what? The cost was so great, none of us could do it. So Jesus Christ did it. And that should turn our hearts, step one, to thankfulness. Every moment, every opportunity, every breath, every heartbeat, every situation, everything we go through is due to our Creator. That's it. We're not, we don't even appreciate this world 
or heaven to come without God creating us and giving us our lives and our opportunities. And with a thankful heart, we're called to move forward. So thankfulness is having a heart that recognizes God as the author, the provider, and sustainer of our lives, of our faith, of our blessings, of our opportunities. He's the one. He's the one that created them. He's the one that provides. He's the one that sustains in each and every day of our lives. And that demonstration of that reality of us being, living that way is a thankfulness that God calls us to. The second one is, um, is to tell. I want to look at something in Paul's life, but man, the telling part is so, is so deep and so profound. So I'm going, to, I'm going to give an example of Jesus here as well. But Paul says in Acts chapter 9, starting in 19, he just is converted and he's in Damascus. And it says that Saul spent several days with his disciples in Acts 9, 19 through 22. Saul spent several days with his disciples in Damascus, with the disciples in Damascus. And at once he began to preach. He began to tell. He began to talk about God in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and said, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. I find that those verses... um, profound, a little bit perplexing, honestly, because as I said earlier, right away he starts talking about Christ. He goes right out. But right after this happened, as soon as this was completed, remember in, um, in, in Galatians 1, Paul says, then he then went and spent three years. He spent three years in, in Arabia away from the disciples. He went back into his word, into the scriptures, and started reading them differently. He started reading them in a way that that was um, not how he used to read them. He used to read them as as a law, as the Messiah is still coming, as, as these Christians are wrong and need to be persecuted. They're taking us away from the faith. Now he starts to read them that Jesus is the Messiah. It took him three years. He went away for three years. He immediately went out and started preaching, but then Jesus called him and said, no, 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 you you need to spend some time getting ready for the ministry I have for you. Sometimes we're called in to tell, and sometimes we're not called in to tell. Turn with me to Mark 5, chapter 1, and we're going to spend a few minutes right here. Mark 5, 1. And I want to set the scene before we read it. So this is going to be the famous story where Jesus goes across the lake and and casts demons out of of a man. They go into the swine, they run into the lake, they, they drown themselves. Okay, that's where we're headed. But did you know, like before this happened, Jesus was spending time with a crowd. He's with a crowd of people, lots of people. He's ministering to them, he's teaching them. He even had one of those members come up to him and say, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. And Jesus said, follow me. And he said, I can't yet because someone just died and I need to go bury him. And he said, let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. And sadly, the guy couldn't come to grips with that. He couldn't follow, and maybe, maybe he did. Maybe he went and took care of business super quick and came back and followed Jesus. Maybe that all happened. But at that moment, he didn't. He didn't follow. Jesus said, follow. Please follow. After that scene, Jesus says, get the boat ready. We've got to go over to the other side of the sea. We've got some business to do over there. It's the scene where he gets in the boat, the waves are crazy, he falls asleep, they have to wake him back up because the storms are so bad they're coming into the boat, they're afraid the boat's about to sink. 
Jesus wakes up, calms the wind and the waves, and the disciples are like, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Okay, that's the scene. Now he steps onto shore, and let's pick up in Mark 5, 1. So after they went across the lake to the region of, of Gerasenes, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had been chained hand and foot, but he tore his chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When no one, or I'm sorry, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of Jesus. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What's your name? He said, My name is Legion. He replied, For we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission. And the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who was possessed by a legion of demons sitting there, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it were told by people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told him uh, about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who was demon-possessed begged him to go with him. Can I follow you, Jesus? Jesus said no. Jesus did not let him. But he said, go home to your people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. I picked this story about the, for, the, for the point of telling because I'm amazed that Jesus was with a crowd of people. He left a crowd of people to fight a vicious storm to heal a man who none of us would think deserves or would, we, none of us would go to that guy, right? I mean, we're not going to a guy who's out of his mind, who's cutting himself with stones, who's breaking chains, who's demon-possessed. Like, we're not going to that guy. That's not a guy worth leaving a crowd that you're teaching the gospel to for. We don't go tell those people anything. But Jesus did. Jesus risked the lives, not really, right? I mean, he he calmed the seas and knew what he was doing, but he risked the lives of his disciples for one man who was a lunatic, who was crazy. Telling is, let's jump, I think we missed one slide, let's jump two slides ahead. Telling is putting your faith in action even at times when it doesn't make sense. But, but most of the time, mostly God's going to call us into everyday practical situations. There are going to be times when it doesn't make sense. What Jesus did in the story doesn't make sense. He was teaching a group of people who, who wanted to be there, who wanted to learn from him, to go to a person who, who was a, you know, the demons were scared to death. The guy had, was out of his mind. He had no idea what was going to happen. And yet, what a difference that man made when he goes back and tells his, his story. It's like, it's like Saul. It's like the people who seem to have the hardest, most challenging lives and stories are the ones who become the greatest evangelists for Jesus Christ. And sometimes telling those people 
is exactly where God wants us. Sometimes God wants us to go to the hard places. I know each one of us. I, I'm included. Everyone, We all have those hard conversations. You think, I need to tell them about Christ. You're like, no way. I won't, I've tried that before. Uh, the ridicule, the frustration. Sometimes it's hard. And sometimes it's just everyday practical conversations. And God calls us to tell in each of those. Third is to be, to be glad and rejoice. Look, look, I can't say this one any better than Paul did. Philippians 4, 4 through 9. It's up on the screens here. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say it. Rejoice. Let your gen- gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about any, anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received from me, or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. This this B word here is interesting. Be glad and rejoice. It, it, it's, it's an action word. It's something that we do. It, it's, like, it's like when you want to become something, or you want to be kind or you want to be compassionate, or you want to be joyful and rejoice, it's, there's an action to it. I think we see those people who are always like, it doesn't matter what moment you catch them in, they're happy and they're rejoicing. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. doesn't matter. That's a choice that they've made. Like, there's no way they're always doing great. It's not possible. This world doesn't afford us to always be great. But it doesn't say to always be great or always be glad or always rejoice. It doesn't say that. It says to always be glad and rejoice in God. It's a focus issue. Are we going to focus on the circumstances and situations around us in this world? Or are we going to focus on God? Because I assure you when we get to heaven, there will be nothing but glad and rejoicing. And we can all see that and appreciate that. That's because we will have no other focus than Jesus Christ himself in heaven. That will be our focus. Well, guess what? Today it's, it's training. It's like going back and practicing those shots in the driveway. It's like going back and practicing that musical instrument. It's training. That it doesn't come natural to be glad and rejoice. That's not a natural tendency. But he that started a good thing is faithful to complete it in you. God is sanctifying every one of us every day to become more like him. And this is one of those areas that we continue to become more like him. And the thing that he calls us to do is to be kind, is to be compassionate, is to become more like him. But in this verse, it says to be glad and rejoice. I love how one thing that Paul gives, he gives us a hint in these verses. He gives us these things to think about. Don't overlook that. Because I think there's a secret there. If you want to be glad and rejoice, I I think it starts in the mind. It's like those great verses in Romans that talks about renewing your mind, you know, that that, 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 that it has to change, it has to transform, it has to become new. And, it, and he's saying the same thing here. You have, to, you, you have to have your mind change. You've got to think about such things. I have, I have one illustration I want to share very quickly that, that talks about the mind change. Uh, I read this in a book a few years back, and it has stuck with me just profoundly. I think about it all the time. And it said that our life is a field. 
And it's a typical field. It's got grass that grows up tall. It's got trees scattered here and there. It's got some brush that's hard to get through. And it has two ponds in the field. So your life has two ponds in the field of your life. And one pond is a cesspool. And one pond is living water, fresh, clean, amazing. For some crazy reason as human beings, for whatever it is, we are drawn to the cesspools. We're drawn to them. We've got to go see what's going on over there. To the things that we shouldn't be a part of, to the things we shouldn't be thinking about, to the things we shouldn't be doing or saying, we're somehow drawn to these. And we're drawn to, the more we get drawn to them, the more we get drawn to them. So in, the, in our lives in this field, we start to create a, a pathway to this cesspool. And you know how fields work. As a, there's a pathway, that's an easy place to go. We walk the pathway, it's no problem. We walk it and we can get to the cesspool. And the more we go to the cesspool, the more we trample down the pathway. The more we trample down the pathway, the easier it is to get to the cesspool. And guess what? The fresh living water that God calls us to, his word, his people, his praises, that great fresh water over there, the, 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 it's getting thicker and it's getting grown up more and it's harder to get to that pond. It's hard. Well, if you want to flip that paradigm shift, shift in your life, you have to start walking to the fresh water and it's gonna be hard at first. You're gonna to have to beat down the bushes and you're gonna to have to beat down the, the grass that's grown up. You're gonna to have to create a path. And the more you do it, the wider the path gets, the easier it is to keep going to the fresh water. And the more you go to the fresh water, the more the old path grows up and the weeds and the thicket and the bushes and the trees start. And now it gets really hard to get back to the cesspool. It's hard. But it has to start in your mind because you're going to come right to the fork in the road and you're going to go, which path today? I've started a little path to the fresh water and I've got a path created clearly to the cesspool. Which path? And it starts right there. That's the moment you've got to take every thought captive. And then, then that path becomes great. And I, and I say to be glad and rejoice is choosing that path to the fresh water each and every day. Be glad and rejoice in God. And finally, sing praises to God. Let's look at Ephesians 1, 3 through 10, as our last set of verses, and we'll wrap up. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to the adoptions of his sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise and the glory <coughs> of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood. So, so let's back up. We're going to sing praises to the God of our Father. So Paul says we're going to sing praises. Verse 3, that's what we're going to do. We're going to praise be to God the Father who has blessed us. And then he tells the why. He goes into the why right here. Why are we going to praise him? And this is why we should praise him, among many other reasons. These are amazing reasons, and there's so many more. Paul chooses because he chose us. Like, he chose us. He cared so much that he died for us. He predestined us. God's so powerful, he knew each and every situation and who would choose long before the foundation of the world. He knew it. He predestined. He understands. He is in all time at all, and involved in all situations. He knew exactly who would become the adoptions of sons. Paul praises him for that. Paul praises him because in verse 7 he says, In him we have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of sins. Praises him for his salvation. And with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mysteries of his will. You know, God's word and the mysteries he gives us and the depth of his knowledge is praiseworthy. Just having his word each and every day to know the heart of God 
it's, I always think of God's, of God's word as the Bible as an owner's manual. It's like for your car. Like you're, unfortunately, too many of us don't read cars' owner's manuals, right? We just ignore them. We just go start the car up the first time and push buttons and see what works. And, oh, there's a new button. Didn't see that last time I had a car. Try that one. And that's what we do. And that, that's how our cars work. And unfortunately, some of us in the Christian life do the same thing. We don't read through God's word. And we're like, let's try this out and see how this works. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, let's try this out. Like, let's wait. And we just... But you know what? The Bible's like the owner's manual for your life. If you actually read it through, just like if you read the car's owner's manual, you, there, I, I assure you, we all have features in our cars that we are not getting the most out of because we didn't read the manual. There's something it does that we have no idea. And I can assure you that if you're not in God's word, there's a lot in that scripture that will tell you exactly how we should live. To sing praises to God is to understand who God is and to acknowledge it. Understand who God is and acknowledge it. To live daily in his presence and to glorify him. That's what I, when I think of singing praises to God, that's how I see it. Understanding God and acknowledging who he is, living daily in his presence and giving him the glory. I want to leave you with this challenge. How are you maintaining a thankful lifestyle that rejoices in God and gives him the praise? Let me say that again. How are you, how, are, how am I, maintaining a thankful lifestyle, a lifestyle of thanksgiving that rejoices in God and gives him the praise, gives him the praise, he gets the praise. And does that statement excite you so much that you can't contain it? You can't contain what God's done for you. You can't contain who he is in your life. You can't contain the praise that wells up in you. That you, you can't help yourself but to tell others around you. You can't help it. He's so, such an outpouring in your life, you can't help it. And that's my challenge. Reflect on Psalm 9, 1 and 2 the next several days if you get opportunity to and just pull out those four and, and start to work on those steps in your life and see if the outpouring will be one that can't be contained, that others around you will benefit from hearing you and from seeing your actions. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for your salvation. We're grateful for your love for us. I just pray that these words will impact us, will change us, will make us more like you, that we'll have an opportunity to give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.